I'm Ashton Addison from EventChain for Investment Pitch Media and the Crypto Coin Show. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Bob Reed, the co-founder and the CEO of Everest. Bob, welcome to the show and thanks for taking the time to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. I'd love to kick off our conversation by just learning a little bit more about Everest. If you can give an overview and the focus of the project. Sure. Uh, we designed what looks like a decentralized version of India stack or the government of Estonia, uh, oh. which comes with some fundamental elements of biometric digital identity, a wallet, a ledger, a regulated stable coin that all, uh, if you will, allows you to do anything in society from mass market DeFi to voting, to supply chain, to anything. Uh, wow. Well, yeah, we've been working on it for about three years. Uh, worked with governments, digitizing banks, and now we're coming out with our first, uh, if you will, direct-to-consumer uh, app ourselves. Wow, that's great, Bob. And yeah, Everest has so many different lines of products. And just to you know, democratize uh, access to all of these financial services, um, I, we, I want to touch on each of those products a little bit, but maybe you can talk about, you know, what are the sort of main goals of getting these financial services or what are the main products and who are you delivering those to? Sure. So uh, it's funny, you have the grin we, we've seen a lot, which is, wow, that sounds like the mother of all chains to re-democratize everything. And mm -hmm. it honestly, it's been one of our stumbling blocks. Like, how do you explain mm -hmm. something that big? Totally. And so what we've done, to your point, we've narrowed it down to a couple of core things that we're starting to go to market. One is fiat on ramps, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to get, as I put it, there's like a million folks in DeFi right now by wallets. If you want to get to 100 million or 500 million, you've got to be able to do two clicks from someone's checking account into a wallet into DeFi, et cetera. So we're doing fiat on-ramps, Europe, Australia, US, uh, adding about five or 10 other countries around the world so that huh. it doesn't take a massive amount to get there. So fiat on-ramps, integrating DeFi, um, those are the major ones we're going to market with right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, the on-ramp is gonna be super important, especially just for on-ramping and off-ramping as well. And that, that accessibility, and you're right, a million people in DeFi is almost nothing compared to what the global financial system needs, which is almost everybody in the world, right? Everybody. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the uh, major cruxes of the DeFi industry right now is that pretty much all of the products are running on the Ethereum blockchain, and there is a lot of congestion, and the transaction fees are not uh, suitable for people that you know are looking for microservices and people in developing countries. You're looking at tens to hundreds of dollars. I know that you're also developing the Everchain, uh, which is going to be solving some of those issues. Can you just talk about working with the Ethereum blockchain, other blockchain protocols, and then integrating Everchain into the platform? Sure. So. Uh... Everchain is a what would be called uh, an L2 solution. Uh, it's a combination between uh, roll-up or mm -hmm. uh, full sidechain is what it would be uh, mm -hmm. relative to Ethereum. It processes hundreds of thousands of transactions a second for pennies, right? So it's mm -hmm. essentially free. Um, what we do from there is we do a bridge out to mainnet, which allows tokens to come in and across. Uh, and also transactions to be verified in and out. Mm -hmm. And we're building additional bridges out to some of the other major uh, chains so that it should end up where a user can be on Polkadot, Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. well, one of the, you know, you mentioned with the fee at on-ramp and off-ramp, having like a two-click process or making it easy, I'm guessing a layer two solution also adds a little bit of complexity as opposed to just using Ethereum you know, by itself. Um, is that something that you have a trade-off in, in managing? It's interesting. It's technically um, complicated because you're mapping what happens on mainnet onto Everchain and making sure those are synchronized, you don't lose anything. So mm -hmm. on a technical layer to move tokens back and forth uh, across the bridge, um, you have to be careful, really careful. Um, yeah. From a user point of view, it'll be seamless. Mm -hmm. They literally like... Um, if you will, designing it so my mom can do this, right? Mm -hmm. It literally, she won't know that it's on Ethereum or Everchain. It's literally going to be, oh, 
couple of clicks, she won't understand that it's truly like you're pulling an ID token off of mainnet, pushing it over to Everchain, it's getting stored there and synchronized across. Like, mm -hmm. it would be invisible there. That's good to know. And yeah, I think the user experience being seamless will definitely... Uh, is a must have if you want mainstream adoption. And I'm glad that you mentioned the ID token there, but I also just want to talk about the Ever ID and the identity portion as a whole. You know, right now in the decentralized finance industry, it seems that, you know, not there's not really any KYC or identity and even sometimes the teams are anonymous and they don't even have their identities out there. So what do you, what do you think of this identity uh, part of moving into decentralized finance and then how are you managing that? So, um Look, it's a bit of heritage. Uh, I came from BitTorrent before this uh, a yeah. few years ago. And we saw as a protocol maker, you can make software and beautiful software and regulators can't say anything or do anything. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you start becoming an aggregator or intermediary, you absolutely have to play by the rules, which are the laws that will literally put someone in jail if you don't. Right? Mm hmm so the way we approach this was we started to your point with we have a product called Ever ID. It's, a, <clears throat> it's a, sort of the base uh, product of our solution. It has identity, but literally only the user can open it. Mm -hmm. So that means I have my driver's license, passport, proof of address, um, all my other credentials that make up my digital identity. I can share the bare minimum mm -hmm. in order to do a transaction like if I'm doing a $50 transaction, there's no KYC required. Regulator doesn't need to know. It's That's anonymous. And it should be, like yeah. cash is. Mm -hmm. You're doing a $10,000 transaction. As an aggregator, we need to go, and this gets, we have to do the bare minimum mm -hmm. to satisfy the legal requirements. What that means, like, here's your proof of address and your name that's validated. You don't get to look at their bank balance. You don't get to look yeah. at their Instagram account. You don't get to look at like all that other stuff. And so we architected so it's massively private. Mm -hmm. Even Everett can't see it. Mm. But still transparent enough to do that social contract of sending money and staying legal. So that, that's uh, literally how we've approached it. Definitely. And I think that's the right approach. And right now, there's all this discussion about everyone just giving away their information for free on all these social platforms and technocracy using our information to sell it to other people and be making us the product, right? So sort of flipping that on its head, I think that that's a good approach for Everest. Yeah, I would say like what you'll see from us later this year is literally how you monetize yourself. This is my data, right? It's what Dorsey talks about when he talks about, I want to do Twitter. You have to start where the user owns the database. Mm -hmm. He owns their own thing. Nobody in the world can open it. It's all their data. And I will share my GPS history to somebody that wants to pay for it. Mm -hmm. If not, they don't get it. Definitely. That's, uh, that's the right approach to it. Now, Bob, you mentioned that you've been working on this for a few years. Can you just give a scope of you know, where you're at right now, what's launched? Absolutely. So uh, we started a few years ago, and we had to build out different components of a platform and prove them in the field, which were, how do you do biometric identity attached to a wallet? How do you then do programmable stable coins? Right? So we like did a bunch of that in Indonesia, BRI Bank. We then did KYC for uh, Central Bank. Um, right? We started doing if you will, a bunch of proofs of concept that would show those four or five elements. And now we're at the point where we're literally going direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. We're launching that here uh, shortly where it's here's a consumer facing app and web where you can go my data, connect fiat, plug into DeFi, plug into centralized finance, uh, move money and if you'll manage your life accordingly. That's great. That's great. And you did mention the ID token uh, previously here and I want to touch on that and you know, how the ID token is actually involved in the ecosystem and does it create a sustainable ecosystem for the end users that when they're using it in the platform? Sure. So the ID token is most easily thought of uh, like a software seat, right? It's mm -hmm. access, right? So if you will, uh, the bank comes to us and says, we want to onboard 100,000 users and we want to have you create accounts and do complicated smart contracts with certain level of reporting well, that requires a certain amount of ID tokens to be bought mm -hmm. and staked and held. It's different than if, for example, uh, 
an end users in California and they go like, I want to join the remittance club here. I want to buy five ID tokens because I'm going to send money once a month to mom in Mexico or the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with the ID token, in addition to access, different levels of access gets you different levels of functionality for different levels of time. Right. So it's pretty much software. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it also gets into governance, right? So we will have part of our treasury that's allocated where the community can vote. Like, we think the Philippines is important. Mm -hmm. We think Mexico is important. Let's go ahead and allocate some of those tokens and go incentivize uh, more network usage. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you were talking about how you're working on the you know the end user part right now, and that you need to stake ID tokens for access. Is that already live, or is that just coming in the near future here? It's uh, we're testing it right now. So like it works, uh, it's not live to the public yet. Okay, great to know. And I was also yeah. reading that there is a, a credit, a CRDT token that's a stable coin. It's almost like a two token system within Everest. Maybe you could touch on that, why it's in there and what are the benefits of having a stable coin as well? Sure, so the ID token, uh, if you will, it, metaphorically, it looks a little bit like a bond in a way, right? It will reflect the underlying economy that happens with all those different functions, right? Okay. As, right. Uh, the credit token is programmable fiat, right? Mm, yeah. So it is, I can take euros, dollars, pesos, krona in and program them to be worth ETH, BTC, or pay mom's bills in Manila, mm. right? Whatever yeah. it is. Um, and so what we, you know, again, going back full circle of how do you represent a real economy? Real economy has, you have to have a stable currency. Yeah. You have to, you can't have a massively fluctuating thing. Um, and yet you still need to have some representation of the value of that total economy. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why we ended up with a two, two token solution. Um, yeah. and the credit token, like I said, uh, it's regulatory approved. Mm -hmm. which means as like you'll see European Central Bank is now talking about stable coins that aren't based on real assets that mm -hmm. right you they'll at scale they displace the credit market they displace the euro and that won't be accepted mm -hmm. um, so again like going through the two years of regulatory hurdles um, is paying off definitely and yeah and I, I want to ask you about that but Speaking of credit, um, I wanted to ask you, in terms of decentralized finance, you know, being able to build credit, uh, and if you're doing microservices and loans and things like that, and you have a minimal amount of ID, or in some cases in DeFi platforms, it's anonymous, is there a credit aspect where you're sort of building a reputation? Is that something that Everest is considered and has in the platform? Yes. So by default, um, a user has uh, all of their transaction history that they can share. Um, as a matter of, here's a, it's a fun metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, most people, my, here's my real wallet. Um, when they say a digital wallet, they really mean one loop, right? It's like one of these cards. Mm -hmm. When Everest says ever wallet, it's this whole thing, mm -hmm. right? So it literally is my identity card, all of my loops, my insurance cards and all of my transactions on my receipts. And so mm -hmm. I can share the receipts like, oh, you want to see all of my transaction history? That's my credit score. You can mm -hmm. see that I'm credit worthy at this point. So think of this, um, which by the way, on a UX level is hard to represent, but definitely it's massively important if you want to get into uh, sharing your credit and stuff. Definitely. And yeah, great metaphor. And now in terms of building out all these products for you know, more on the end consumer side, what do you think will be one of the key factors to success that you will need to have this mainstream adoption in the long term for Everest? So we've done the hard work already, which was getting the regulatory approval for the, the credit. And what that opens up for us and the way we designed the issuing and the redemption of it is getting fiat on ramps. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing, right, that's the critical feature in order to get mass market adoption. We can now go into almost any country. It's everyone I know of um, without a secondary license and actually get fiat on ramps. Um, so Singapore, Manila, sorry, Philippines, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, like all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
that's going to be the critical piece. And that's literally just a matter of, at this point, wiring up the APIs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And we're running out of time, but how can the viewers learn more information and get involved in the community for Everest? Uh, Everest.org uh, is our website. From there, you can reach, if you will, Telegram or, uh, or just generally Everest. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. All the best with this project moving forward. I will definitely be following along, and let's follow up in the near future. Awesome. Thanks, Ashton.